Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series uh, where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. The show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show and it is then posted onto our website so you can watch it at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. Both the live show and the archived recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the um, shows we have, um, have on um, coming up or in our archives. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, and that's um, we provide services to all libraries in the state. So you will find things on our show that are for public, academic, K-12, uh, corrections, museums, anything that's a library. <laughs> um, that's really that is really our only criteria. Of what we do here is um, on the show is things that are um, having to do with libraries something that a libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing, um, services and products we think they may be of interest to, um, that may be interest to them. We do sometimes bring in guest speakers from outside the library commission, uh, libraries sharing cool things they're doing at their libraries, um, other organizations talking about what they're doing with libraries. Um, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff do sessions and that's what we're doing today. Um, with me today is Amanda Sweet. Amanda. <laughs> she is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission and she does now newish a monthly uh, show monthly episode of Encompass Live is her pretty sweet tech. Um, yeah <laughs> so um, so yeah that pretty sweet Amanda Sweet, yeah. Sweet all all. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the last Wednesday of the month will always be pretty sweet tech. Um, so if you're into that kind of thing, if that's your job or something you're interested in is tech, tech specifically tech related things having to do with libraries, that'd be the shows to um, sign up for with Amanda. And today we are going to talk about robotics. It's true. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you teach robotics? Can you teach robots? I, don't know. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> so yeah, everything you ever wanted to know about um, having your own robot. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Your own personal robot. That would be the <laughs> um, So I'll just hand it over to you, Amanda, to tell us all about it. <laughs> so the question of the, of the day is, why robot? So um, I can tell you what a robot is. It's a quick Google search away. <laughs> but the main question is, who in your community actually wants to learn about robotics and why? And that is, so in kind of teaching in instruction and design, the first step in actually figuring out what you want to teach is figuring out who's learning. Mm -hmm. So in our communities, there's been a huge focus on teaching robotics to kids. But what about adults? And what about mm -hmm. older adults? So there's a multitude of different reasons that robotics and technology would be of interest to people in your community. And when you figure out the answer to who's learning and why, you have the start of a marketing campaign and you have the start of what kind of content you're actually going to be teaching in different sessions. Mm -hmm. and that would that would be for anything you're doing with library really exactly yeah find out what people in your community specifically want yeah and it's going to vary from community to community so you know you doing something and your library in the town down this down the road are going to yeah. tend to be completely different things yeah so you can grab a robotics kit and you can start going through the curriculum that's available with the robotics kit that's probably the easiest and quickest no thought way to get started into robotics and there will be some examples of robotics kits that you can do just that. But you can also cater it mm -hmm. to the actual needs of your community. So just <clears throat> doing like a quick anecdotal questioning of people that come into the library regularly or going out to different organizations in the community to find out what concerns people actually have. Mm -hmm. And as you can see on this list, 
top one on there is just general exposure to STEM principles. People are hearing about it all the time. Yep. Just like vaguely in the news yeah. or from the school and they may not nothing. even know. Yeah. It means absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Like if you say we need to expose people to STEM concepts, people that are outside of a STEM field, it means nothing. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that STEM actually applies to a multiple different fields. It's interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary. It goes everywhere. We as librarians, there's a technology librarian because we use STEM in everything. Because we need it, yes. Yeah. And we also, so people impact the use and creation of technology, of technology developers and people who make software, people who make robotics, they study the people who are going to be using it. And they figure out who they're working with and why. That's sociology, humanities, psychology. And that's, the H in STEM is silent, but it's there. Yeah, <laughs> everyone is, and I know that's something that people have been talking about because we've been focusing for so many recent years on all of the techie part of STEM, you know, science, yeah. math, engineering, etc. But people want are saying we need to bring back in the H, the humanities, yeah. or yeah. Um, everything. Stream, it's... bring back in the reading. Well, reading is part of everything, but sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's everything kind of... is really connected, yeah. and I, I guess. I mean, break down the silos. It's mm -hmm. we're trying to kind of box in STEM concepts, but we shouldn't. No, it's you're going to need other things that you don't really think about in order to successfully yeah. use those. Yeah, and yeah. when we get into the different types of robots later on, you'll see how that's actually crossing over into every different field. Mm -hmm. And being able to, so our goal is either, do you want to make technology? Do you want to use and leverage technology? Mm -hmm. More adults now are going to be focused on using and leverage, leveraging technology. Because, mm -hmm. so the yeah. World Economic Forum in 2018, they put out a report about the different technology that's going to be impacting the world and changing the landscape of the jobs of the future mm -hmm. and changing the landscape of our communities. And they identified robotics as one of the main things, robotics and automation as one of the main things that will be impacting us. But a robot is not just a robot. It's actually infused with artificial intelligence, and mm -hmm. there's a whole slew of different cross technologies that will be impacting us. So it's more or less, mm -hmm. you're not just teaching about a robot. Who cares about a robot? You don't see that or interact with that in everyday life. So if you average put out a little advertisement that says, come learn how to make a robot, Adults don't care about that. Kids will think it's awesome and fun. Yeah. But yeah. And but if you say learn how technology is impacting us, learn how the workforce is changing, learn which skills you need to learn to become more competitive in the future workforce. That's what people want to know. It's what people are terrified about, but it's what people want to know. So this will actually go over more different resources that you can go to to learn about how technology is actually impacting us. A big one that I actually went to is um, Future Learn, mm -hmm. is a website that has like a whole bunch of different um, courses, online courses that you can take, and they are mm -hmm. developed by different universities across the world. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> are those um, free courses or They're, some most of them are free little? to audit. Oh, um, okay. You can upgrade right, sure. it to get the little piece of paper saying I did this, mm. but I do so many of them that I just audit them. Yeah, it's, yeah, <laughs> just for your own education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I took one about what is robotics, and it actually talks about from a researcher's perspective and from a designer's perspective how this technology is actually like where this technology is actually at right now, where it's going in the future and what people actually need to know about it. Yeah. And what I looked at after that is actually who was enrolled in the class, who was commenting. There were thousands of comments on this board for Future Learn, and it was actually from across different generations. And I actually looked at the motivation people had to take that course to extend it over to why people might want to come into the library to take a course about robotics. Mm -hmm. 
So it's not just learn how to do engineering and design. That's cool, but people want to learn how it's actually going to impact them right now. They want to voice their concerns. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of trouble that I have sometimes with some of these things is learn how to how to use a 3D printer, learn how to do use all this equipment, you learn how to okay, but then what? Why? Why? Like, why why am I coming it? to learn how to use this? Yeah, that's why the robot? part that I no. think I mean and we're working on that with our makerspace, I think yeah. a lot better yeah. now and all the makerspaces and libraries that they've realized, sure, you can have all the equipment, you can have the robots, but if you don't make it but, meaningful to people, just the fun, oh look, I made something with a three D printer isn't yeah. gonna See, the, get anywhere. The yeah. thing is that that doesn't actually follow design thinking process. Yeah. <laughs> because we're trying to teach design thinking process using the tools, but we we put the tool before the problem. Right, and that's backwards. Yep. Yep. And we should have actually identified what our specific problem was and then mm-hmm. chosen a tool that actually meets that need. Absolutely. And yep. instead we're going backwards, mm-hmm. which works in some cases. We sometimes you get know, You can backstep and, and figure it out and make it work. Yeah. yeah. Like but it, realize that you have to do that. Yeah. yeah. So, and this, I'll have this list of possible goals available in a handout later on so you don't have to drop down everything and memorize everything yes the slides will all be available with the recording and everything so so with the idea of why are we learning and who are we teaching we can look at what a robot actually is so right now this is actually what i thought of when i actually thought of robots Mm -hmm. my my little r2d2 he's delightful but the robots in science fiction they're usually kind of taken over the world. And they're, they have greater capability than what they actually are able to be doing right now. Mm. I watched a TED Talk that was actually published in 2017 that featured a professor from Brown. And he was really excited that he was able to get his robot to open a door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the level we're at now is yeah. not yet. Yeah, I mean, there yeah. are some scary things that some are getting to do now that yeah. they did, you know, and I think that is scaring some people. Oh, like, scary. on the other side yeah. of, like, he's excited, but I'm like, uh-oh, you just let that, you just taught that robot how to get out. Yeah. All by itself. Yeah. Have and, you seen Terminator? Yeah. <laughs> it's And other, you know. <laughs> and that's why we are seeing technology through a sheen of science fiction. Yeah. And, like what I just said. I mean, yeah. some people think of this. Some people think of the bad, you know, robots, the killer yeah. robots. Um, but then there's like, and yeah. This is actually, so in reality, this would actually be a fusion between artificial intelligence, robotics, and um, holographic imaging, volumetric mm-hmm. imaging. Mm-hmm. And that could actually be an augmented reality display. Right. Yep. But it's we're so we're not there so <laughs> very 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 far from that volumetric imaging is it's still in research and development and mm-hmm. it's not nearly stable enough to actually be able to work there's a lot of fake images on youtube saying that it is a lot further along really? than it is mm-hmm. so you got to be careful what you're yeah. looking at yeah but it's cool and it may happen one day but it's not this is not the robotics we should be learning right now. What it actually is. And that little dude on the right, he doesn't exist either. Um, this is all fake. They're getting closer. Mm-hmm. There are robots that exist that look physically like that, but for the most mm-hmm. part, they aren't able to interact with all of their limbs. Mm-hmm. And they're not able to think and act independently in the world. Hmm. Like they are really heavily programmed and can only interact in highly specific task oriented situations. Yeah. So this robot exists in the world just because it's trying to mimic and play upon science fiction. It knows people like that. So 
because it's popular in the world, the robot was created through people-centered design to cater to what they think people want. And some human aid robots were actually created because they thought that they would be friendlier looking for people. Mm-hmm. Sure. But they also found out that there's there's this effect that if a robot is 99 or like 99% of the way similar to an actual human being, but some of the facial features are off, it's actually creepier. Mm-hmm. The uncanny than, valley. Yeah. yeah. They're just not human enough. To, to scare you. Yeah, pretty <laughs> Be much. like, no, something's wrong with you. Don't look yeah, at me because I can't look at you. <laughs> yeah. It's like, but the, and there is no universal definition of a robot. There's too yeah. many different varieties, and every different researcher and every different creator is making a different brand and flavor. Mm-hmm. But this is just a generic the criteria option. that might yeah. meet yeah, that. And this listing is actually from the IEEE. Mm-hmm. It's the International Electrical Engineers. Oh, I can't remember the last word, but it's Three E's. Yeah. Institute, Institute of Electrical Electric- and Electronics Electronic. Engineers. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but you just IEEE. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so the a robot is able to sense the environment, and it can move within a, an environment. One of the most common robots that you'll probably see in maker spaces and in industry right now is the moving arm. Mm-hmm. So it has a stationary lock, but it's still able to move within its environment because the arm is moving within the environment. And it's powered through either battery or it's wired up through an electricity source. And then the intelligence is actually, people give it intelligence. It's programmed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And because of how far robotics is right now, they have to be mainly really task-oriented. And the same is true of artificial very, intelligence. And very limited tasks. Yeah. It's a certain set yeah. of things that they can do, yeah. yeah. And FutureLearn also has a course for artificial intelligence that shows how to leverage artificial intelligence in business. Mm -hmm. And they actually stated that um, it was over 60% of all artificial intelligence was machine learning oriented and extremely Mm -hmm. task-based. And it's just Mm -hmm. because, so when you're teaching anything about technology, It's more about looking at one larger process that everyone does in everyday life and then finding out how technology can assist with one smaller subtask. And automation Mm -hmm. happens when more subtasks within that larger routine start getting taken over by technology. Mm -hmm. So every task within that process probably won't be taken over immediately. But it just kind of over time. And that's why people actually need to get reskilled in learning how to leverage technology so that they can gain an edge in the field just by being able to recommend that new technology and then take point in implementing that technology. So right now computer like libraries are really focused on giving computer access and learning how to get, um, teach basic computer literacy, mm-hmm. which is awesome. And that computer literacy is going to be a foundation for future technology. So when we're learning about how to use a keyboard and a mouse, how to interact with websites, how to do privacy and security, that same privacy and security is going to sink over to all internet-powered devices and any artificial intelligence or algorithm-based tools. Looking at how it's made, who made it, which decisions went into the process, and and if it actually suits our specific needs. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. when I talk about sensors, there's about a million and one different ways that robots can actually interact with the environment. So this is just kind of like a smattering of the most common ones that you'll find in robot toys. Mm -hmm. And the acceleration, gyroscope, and magnometer they're actually also in virtual reality reality headsets. Oh, sure. So they right. help orient in time and space, know when you turn your head, mm-hmm. when you tilt your head, when the controller is being moved within space. 
And so when you add more sensors to different devices, it also adds capabilities. But those capabilities also mean that the technology is able to track you better too. Yeah. So you gotta give up something, yeah. a little bit of your privacy as yeah. with anything like this, yeah. So that's why we look at privacy policies. So these are the sensors that are used in Google's mm -hmm. Internet of Thing devices. Mm -hmm. yep. A lot of the Internet of Thing device sensors will overlap with the sensors that are used in robotics. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can actually use this list down here yeah. as a multitasking tool to learn how, ro how and why the tools and mm -hmm. skills that you learn from that robotic toy will translate over into real life because you just learned how to gather and collect data using a small sensor on a toy robot, but that same skill is going to translate over to the Internet of Things, which people are going to use in everyday life. And the Internet of Things will also be collecting information about people, which is also one of the digital literacy skills that we are teaching to patrons every mm -hmm. day. So if we pair this list of sensors and what these sensors can collect and use and start asking people what can you do both good and bad with this information and then how can you protect yourself and using an infographic like the stay safe online um, this is an infographic about the growing internet of me mm -hmm. and this can actually be used for a variety of different age groups just to show how the sensors that are just in this phone and the connect the connected devices like the Fitbit here, mm -hmm. how this is. I have things. my little my smartwatch, yeah. Watch, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and so even just looking at if your phone, if your Internet of Thing devices knows when you're not home, how would it know mm -hmm. that you're not home? because you are setting your therm your smart thermostat to get cooler by a certain number of degrees every time you're not home so that you save energy. Mm -hmm. So if someone is able to hack or access the information that says this it's your house is cool during this date range and it's set to be cool during this date range in the on a weekend in September. And sometimes yeah, then they know then that's because a, you're not home. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of like both mm -hmm. people and artificial intelligence use data to make future predictions. So knowing that your house is going to be cooler, that is how we make that future prediction saying, hey, that'd be a pretty good time to rob them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But And future predictions, they are just that. And... That is actually one of the things that we want to pay attention to with artificial intelligence is we are collecting all of this data, providing all of this data, who's using it. A lot of it's for marketing right now. That's what we see in our everyday life. But these Internet of Things devices, connected devices and sensors, they're getting more important. So when mm -hmm. we're teaching robotics, we're not just teaching how a robot is made we're teaching life skills. And that those life skills, depending on how you market it to your community and to different age groups, that can actually draw more people into your library because this is actually stuff that people need to know. Mm -hmm. and, and this may be something that people are, like like the STEM thing, vaguely aware of. Yes, I'm using my Google Home to do things and I, I have my Fitbits because that's the cool thing. It tells me how many steps I met my step goal. Yeah. There's so much more to it yeah. though, that you're not really aware of because you don't realize, well, it knows how many steps I walk because it knows where I'm actually at and yeah. it's keeping track of that info mm -hmm. and where else is that going and it, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And one day would a health insurance company be able to collect that information mm -hmm. through a data broker saying that, hey, we noticed that you used your Fitbit, but we also noticed that it's been tracking your height and weight and health information. And I don't think that you're really a great risk, health risk to be able to provide insurance to. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. until your Fitbit tells us that you're a little healthier, yeah. we're not going to be able yeah. to insure you. So do we really want a situation where companies are able to use information like that? And right now, a lot of this stuff isn't largely regulated. If you look right. at the state, so yeah. yeah. 
like the Stay Safe Online and um, the Privacy Clearinghouse. They give like a huge information about how our data is being collected and used. And more often than not, we don't 100% know how all of our stuff is going out mm -hmm. into the world. I know that I've got, I'm sure there's places that I have information out there that's more giving up more than some other people may be comfortable with, but I, yeah. you know, that's the kind of decision you have to make and you have to try and teach your, your patrons. This is a decision, things you have to think about. How yeah. much are you willing to give up to get these benefits from yeah. the service or the product or the robot or whatever? And that's, it's a balance. And there are people who are saying, no, nothing, and that's fine, yeah. you know? You just won't have the benefits of you know the, the certain things that they can offer you, but you know if you want to be more more concerned about your privacy, that's something yeah. you can do. Yeah, but and more data does also help the the actual companies serve you better. That's true. It and, does. I mean, we're and people I know people are you know <clears throat> saying we're just a um, a product. We're just they just want us for the money, like Facebook and whatnot. That it's just about you know they don't really care yeah. about you. It's it's your data. Yes, but <clears throat> they use that data to improve Facebook or to improve or or yeah. Google uses that to improve your watch and yeah. and your services because they can learn from you what you really want to do or what everyone is actually using it for, and tweak it. So yeah. so now anyway, back to robots. Yeah. <laughs> so robots or specifically robots. They actually have to be powered in some way, shape, or form to be able to be a working robot. When you're in your maker spaces, battery is probably the number one thing that you'll go to. I really hope that no mm. one in the library has access to nuclear energy because that would be kind of weird. I mean, you never know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but getting pe just exercises to actually get people thinking about alternative energy sources. Because another thing that we can start teaching people is sustainability mm -hmm. and globalization through robotics. Because the internet, artificial intelligence, all of this stuff has actually made us a global world. It's called the World Wide Web for a reason. Mm -hmm. And now we actually need to just start thinking a bit bigger than we used to before. In 1991, there was one website and now, <laughs> as of 2017, there are, oh, let's mm, see. Is there that, yeah, that running tally? Let's actually just find out. Oh, my keyboard is skipping some keys. Oh. Interesting. Uh, Maybe it's running low on battery. Mm -hmm. Apparently, it only mm. wants me to type at like molasses speed. It actually <clears throat> runs on solar. Speaking of how you power mm. things, I wonder if somebody left it on. Okay. There we go. That's the. So there are 1,716,828,530 websites in the world right now. So with that extreme rapid growth in technology and the rapid growth in the information that these sensors have been providing, mm -hmm. um, in 2016, there was a report done that said that two percent, like, I think it was 90, like a huge percent of the popular world data was generated within the last two years. Yeah, it's exponentially, yeah. yeah. Don't quote me on the actual percentage, but it was like astronomical. Oh. And it's just growing from now. So from this list, we have robots that are able to sense using that huge list of sensors that we looked at from Google. They're able to move within the actual environment and they are powered by an energy source that is hopefully alternative to just battery. So now one of the main things that people are looking at is teaching people how to make robots actually intelligent. So I'm just gonna play this quick video about the Roomba mm -hmm. and start looking at how this robot actually moves 
how it's interacting with its environment to not bump into walls mm -hmm. and how it may have been programmed by a human to start looking for these different factors. the bed cleaning, you know, <laughs> just for that it would be worth it. So you can kind of see how the robot, one thing I'd actually want to point out is how did the robot know that it could go through the sheet, but it wasn't able to go through the wall? Uh huh. So Good which question. sensors and which devices did it use to be able to differentiate that? Mm -hmm. And there was one instance where the robot actually bumped into the wall using that contact pressure sensor and then it backed up, mm -hmm. but then it made that turn and it didn't bump into the next wall, but it still did back up. So Does it track a, where it's been? Yeah. yeah. And is that a proximity sensor? Mm -hmm. Did it start collecting information about its environment and did it just know? Mm -hmm. And then how was it able to back back into its charging station? How does it find where home is? going to be something there that tells it, I'm over here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and this is actually a really simple exercise that you can give to library patrons of all mm -hmm. ages. Just watch a video of this robot. And try and figure out how yeah. did it do how all did those it work? things. How did it work? Yeah. yeah. So now if you gave them the general recipe for what makes a robot, just start looking at different examples. And another way that you can do that is to look at the iterations of Roombas. Find a mm. YouTube video from the first vacuum robot out there and then find two or where three they, other videos. Where they've come, how far, how far they've come, yeah. yeah. From that the charging station wasn't there before. No, you had so, to do it for them. Yeah. Or yeah. when it died, it died. Or <laughs> Yeah. So how does technology evolve and what was, what did, designers learn from people and their needs to make those changes. So now vacuum robots are only one of many robots. Mm -hmm. There's also the IEE has this awesome collection of what different robots can actually do. And this looking at these different examples, just going out into space, going out into Hi, here's our vacuum yeah. robot. Furby. Yeah. And there's, they go through educational, and we had the recent flooding there, so mm -hmm. that could actually be a good um, pull into showing how yeah. technology can actually help people. Can we send a robot to excavate a flood site that could be, there could be toxic wastewaters mm -hmm. and sewage waters that right. people it wouldn't be safe for people to go through, but we don't actually care if a robot does it. Mm -hmm. So that could also be like an exercise that we could just ask people, what are some dangerous situations that you wouldn't want to go into? And what are the tasks that would have to be accomplished within that environment? And how could you design a robot that would be able to navigate through the environment to accomplish that task?
So you don't actually have to buy anything to teach about robotics. Mm -hmm. If you know enough about what you actually want to accomplish and what a robot actually is, all you really need is to get people to think. Mm -hmm. And that can be like a whole series of just lesson plans right there is just walking people through how unride robots work, how they impact them personally, and know that people don't actually have to do the circuitry and coding themselves. Right. And there's a ton of apps that are being built right now that are actually making programming robots even easier than it was before. Uh, Purdue mm -hmm. University is actually making a drag and drop block interface for so that app designers can actually start programming robots mm -hmm. instead of the traditional roboticist. They probably won't have as much functionality, but still, mm -hmm. I mean, that's how you get started. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look at mm -hmm. how what the progression of website tools. It used to be oh, yeah. you have to hand code everything, but now you have yeah. WordPress. Right, and you had no yeah. HTML, all the coding. Yeah. No. I still know that. Yeah. No. But yeah. And from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of like as technology grows more popular in the world, the tools to use the technology are going to become more user friendly. So the languages and the tools that people are learning right now, they probably won't exist or even be as relevant in 5, 10, 15, yeah, 20 years really from quickly. now. The internet expanded from 1 to nearly 2 billion websites in the span of, of what, 20 years, give or take? Mm -hmm. And technology is going to do the same thing. So when you're trying to focus on what to <clears throat> teach people, don't focus on the language. Focus on the concept. Mm -hmm. Why does technology exist? Mm -hmm. How is it helping people? And what do we actually need to know to be able to leverage and use this technology to create a better world for us? And it doesn't really matter how much you spend on a robot kit to be able to teach that. <laughs> So you can kind of sift through this list of robot types on your own, kind of see what resonates with you. And then you can start making um, kind of a worksheet to show why robots actually matter. So this is one that I put together to show the similarity between how robots are actually made and then the mm -hmm. different ways they can be used. This is a mm -hmm. lawn making, a lawn mowing robot. Yeah, I've seen those now. There's our little vacuum robot. And if you look at the design here, this little square design, this small compact design, then compare that one to mm -hmm. a pool cleaning robot. And you have that same square compact design and it moves through the environment in a similar way. Mm -hmm. And it's powered through an electric cord here. Mm -hmm. And this one is powered and charged through battery. Right, some of the rechargeable ones, yeah. This one requires more power, so it needs to be plugged in constantly. And this one can be charged and used over time. And this one, it also travels through the environment in a similar way, but it is used to detect and deactivate bombs. Mm -hmm. So once you know the basic fundamentals of robotics, you can apply it in a million different ways. And then mainly it's just getting people thinking about it. So let's close out of here. So the biggest question that I probably get is what are these magical coding principles you're actually talking about? <laughs> so these can actually be got, you can find out what people actually need to know and the keyword terms that you'd want to look up by going to w3schools.com. So when you are looking for different robot tools to bring into your community, they're going to be advertising things like learn how to use conditionals and operators and variables, mm -hmm. and you're going to be like, cool, what is that? <laughs> so, so going to w3schools will kind of give you a head start on seeing how this stuff actually works.
in reality. And it'll give you kind of like a little head start as to how to start implementing that. And you can also use tools like here's a future learn yeah. page. So Raspberry Pi partnered with Future Learn and they are they're basically borrowing Future Learn as their learning management system to show to kind of like parcel out the different learning modules. And so you can learn how to do physical computing with Raspberry Pi. And Raspberry Pi is probably one, it's a really popular kit, mm -hmm. but it's also used more in, they actually sold more units to companies that are doing prototyping for tools that are used in the actual workforce. They sold more hmm. units to the, for that than they did for actual educational. Huh. And, I did not know. Yeah. And the company was designed for educational tools. Yeah, that's what it meant. It was like, if you want to learn how to build a computer or do programming, this yeah. is a quick, easy, cheap way that you can have your own to play with. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And, and a lot of um, hobbyists use that. So if people are already in, like, really into technology and into design. Yeah they will be probably more drawn toward Raspberry Pi and Arduino because it gets into right. the nitty gritty. Yeah. But not everyone really wants to or cares to learn about the wiring and coding and wiring diagrams. <coughs> mm -hmm. So this is kind of like, this is not really a beginner tool. This is not really a, hey, if you're just kind of wanting to dapple around, try Raspberry Pi. But it is a tool that you can go deep down in depth into how technology works and the nitty gritty. But if you just want to show people how and why we need technology, try into introducing robotics. This will go into the ethics of technology, uh, privacy and security issues that will mm -hmm. and are facing the world right now. And it'll go through, um, this is actually the one that I took. Um, it did not take me 11 weeks to actually do it. It is a series of videos and different um, exercises and prompt and prompts that you can do to learn and process But it's go at your own speed. Yeah. But it could yeah. take, if you know they're suggesting it could be 11 weeks. Yeah. And since I audited it, I did not participate in every single prompt that they mm. put out there because honestly, I didn't have the time and I didn't have the need. So yeah. I didn't. You do what looks good for you. Yeah. yeah. So this is a good preparatory tool for if you want to start incorporating like the future of work and why we learn technology into your library. And this is actually where I pulled the how a robot is actually made. So if you want to know how technology is made, how robots are made, and how to start figuring out how to decide how people work to be able to decide how technology should work. And on that goal slide, you may have seen the term people-centered design. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where this comes from is because technology should actually be built to help people and it shouldn't just be there. Yeah, technology for just for the sake of technology is no use to anybody. Pretty much. Start with the people. Yeah. And if you are looking for kits that will start working through this, and yeah. this is actually kind of like the pre-built, pre-packaged curriculum that will... You don't have to do anything with it. It's just already there. It's curated. It's delightful. It's awesome. You can mm -hmm. grab it and go. Is it, which I'm sure good for people who are like, I've never done programming or yeah. robots before, yeah. but I want to bring it to my library or I've got kids, teenagers, adults asking me about it. Yeah. So what can I do here? So Vex Robotics, if you do want to show people what a robot is, why they need it, how it's impacting people, these are actually different pre-made curriculum. 
so yeah and it's basically just like a little click through step by step how it actually works and this vex robotics they also have a robotics competition and similar to lego first it's used in a lot of high schools across the state of nebraska right now okay. and actually across the nation mm -hmm. But so this is a good tool if you want if people actually want to get into the more complex robots playing with different sensors, but they also want the safety of that tutorial that'll give the step by step. This is mm -hmm. what it is. This is how it works. This is why you're doing this, and this is what you might want to do next. Yeah. And then Lego Mindstorms is actually the one that we use through Library Innovation Studios. Right. That's the makerspace equipment that we're putting into libraries across Nebraska. So this is actually really good for programming concepts. So the link that I put here is how you can integrate Python into the EV3, but traditionally they just use a drag and drop block interface. But so this, I pulled this link just to show how it can grow with the user. Mm. So you can start mm -hmm. with that drag and drop block but then transition over into the more complex concepts. Yeah. 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 And then start using Python to show how it interacts with the continuous rotation servo motors and how it makes the robot go forward and backward and turn and all that jazz. So you can make it really easy for younger kids or you can step it up for older kids and adults. And I like the cube. Um, it's made by Make Wonder, and this one also has the option of starting with the drag and drop block interface, and it's all app based. And but it also has the option for JavaScript. So when you pull open the app, it actually has two little tabs on it, and you can click for the drag and drop, and then you can do a full program with that. And then if you click over to the drop the JavaScript section, it'll show what the actual code looks like. So that's actually a really awesome way to start learning how that actually works. And if you pull up the actual, if you, a really simple quick exercise that you can do with beginners is to have people use the drag and drop block interface to show how the robot goes forward three inches. And then once they're able to do that in block, have them click over to the JavaScript and then show them how you can change one number mm -hmm. and how that adjusts how that robot actually interacts. See how it is and how it looks in, when you're in JavaScript, yeah. yeah. And that actually goes through like the, so there's like, there's little stages that goes in mastering skills. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of like, you can't learn what you don't know it exists. So <laughs> maybe, <you Yeah>. know, <laughs> So basically, we're telling people which technology exists. And then you start learning a little bit more and a little bit more, and you start being guided by a teacher, by an instructor, by this curriculum. You start getting more comfortable, and then you shift over into wanting to experiment on your own. And you get less and less afraid that, hey, I'm going to break this. <laughs> and then you start thinking, yeah, I might break it, but I can probably fix it too. <laughs> yeah. not, it's not permanently broken. Yeah. And then you start thinking, I know enough that I can look for the information that I would be able to extend more learning mm -hmm. on my own. And the, then... <laughs> having that self-confidence and empowerment to yeah. go on with more, yeah. yeah. And so then you move from tutorials and then extend over into figuring out how it applies to you personally. And then it's kind of like, then you progress on through mastery and through all that stuff. But then it's kind of, um, how do you give people the motivation to actually learn through this whole thing? Mm. Why do people care? <laughs> and a lot of people question, is the library the right place to do this? But where else would you do it? I mean, this is the kind of thing I think a lot of people think of, well, this is what you go to school for. This is what you go to college to learn. But that's not really, it's not that costs. And it's everyone. not feasible. Yeah. And 
it's becoming so ingrained in everything in our world yeah. that that's not really yeah not feasible for just the average person doesn't need to go to college and take a whole course and become a computer yeah. programmer they just need to know what is all this new stuff i'm hearing about yeah. and i need to understand it because it's coming up in my life yeah yeah so live the role of the library would actually be to have the resources available in case people want to start learning on their own mm -hmm. because there aren't a lot of curated resources out there right now that say this is how you can learn this stuff mm -hmm. and this is actually kind of this is where i see the future of libraries going how do libraries add value to a digital age and this is an option not every library, this isn't going to be suitable for every library, but it's possible. And so this is actually the more popular one is robotics for kids. Mm -hmm. So robots, like if you want to introduce younger kids to circuitry, uh, because learning is a good way to go. And it's because this is already curated. It's stuff that you can grab and go. And it goes through a lot of those different sensors mm -hmm. that we talked about before. Mm -hmm. And you can drag and you can cater it to choose different age groups. They're at. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can choose by sensor and you can cater to subject interest. So this is a good way just to draw in beginners and help introduce those STEM concepts. And the cue is actually, it's that same one that we clicked on for the adults because there's, it's, a, there's, a range there's that course wide range. range. Yeah. Yeah. And this one has that whole curriculum that'll show you um, game design is basically, it'll walk you through how technology is made and that people-centered mm -hmm. design to show Hey, you might want to actually keep people in mind when you're making this. And this one, the creative writing block, is actually really popular in libraries and schools because libraries, stories, creative writing, robots, mm -hmm. they just go together. <laughs> And Raspberry Pi has, they started doing more online training for librarians and educators. So as an educator, if you want to learn more information about how this stuff works, how you can expand your own skill set and how you can contribute more to your own organization, this is an option. And if you just want to be able to show how technology is changing everything, they have a block that you can just do that. So you don't actually need to know how technology is made specifically yourself. You can learn it. Mm -hmm. And the intro to cybersecurity, I haven't actually done this one yet, mm. but it actually looks pretty good. So there's a bunch of different options there. I'm glad there's so many options. Like I said earlier, there's so many of us. I mean, we're talking about our patrons don't, our you know, the people coming into our libraries don't understand these things, but we don't either sometimes. Yeah. I know, yeah. like, you know, some people say, I know enough to be dangerous. True. Or I know some yeah. things, like things that I'm involved in or interested in really well, but some other things I'm like, I just know the word exists, but I need something to tell me yeah. more about it because, yeah, yeah I really need to. The basics yeah and i would recommend before you start taking any of these classes for yourself make sure there's an interest for the information mm -hmm. so oh, when sure you, yeah like when you go out and find out why people want to learn mm -hmm. you can use the information that you learn there to start building your own skill set so to then decide which others. of those intro yeah. courses you're going to focus on taking yeah, yeah. Because why would we learn something that isn't going to be of interest? That we don't need to share with other people, yeah. yeah. Find out what your community is asking for, what they're looking for, what they yeah. might want. Yeah. So that may be more or less than you were looking for <laughs> in a world of robotics. But <laughs> yeah. So if anybody has any questions, um, we're a little out. Oh, we just hit 11 o'clock. Hey, cool. Perfect. 
Um, you can type into the question section of the interface. Um, and here's one, 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 first one did say this is great material. So thank you. Um, Amanda. And want to know about getting a list of the websites. Um, so we didn't, uh, usually we will have a recording available for this after the show and um, the slides will be available as well. So you'll have links to everything that was in yep. there. When we give yeah. you the link to the slides, you'll be able to click on all of them like um, Amanda was to get to any of the websites that she's been talking about. Um, so you'll have that along with the archive um, later today, maybe tomorrow. Um, but we have a question. How have you tailored the content or activities for different age groups or experience levels? So how would you? That's actually something I'm still working on right <laughs> now. So the trick is that I actually work with a bunch of different libraries and a whole lot of different communities. So the time that I have allotted to one specific group did not allow me to test a full curriculum. Mm. I'm only able to... I can test it once and then I'm able to find out how well it works and then I interact with other educators to find out how it works for them too. Hmm. What I'm working on right now is actually personalized learning. Mm -hmm. And that's actually something that it's more of a systems design thing than anything else hmm. because it goes through different stages for the educator has to be able to know enough about the subject matter to be able to break down the information to be able to provide it in a specific way that is fitting with the skill set of the learner. What the learner needs, yeah. And that's actually, I do that for librarians. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, know. I do, yeah. Because we have librarians, uh, like you should talk about in our library innovation studios, maker spaces of all different levels, experience levels, yeah. and knowledge about the different yeah. services, um, different equipment or yeah. things that we're giving them. Yeah. So, honestly, in progress. It's, <laughs> yeah. I haven't actually found the perfect delivery system for personalized mm -hmm. learning for robotics yet. Hmm. I wish I did. Yeah. But some of these links that are specific to kids or adults would be a place at least to start um, with things already out there, yeah. curriculum that already exists, yeah. yeah, and that'd be a place at least to start now. Honestly, it's more, it's not so much for the technology education or and robotics learning using the internet, it's not so much about the teacher being able to regulate the content correctly but giving the learner the tools to learn how to learn, to mm. know when to pause the video, when to switch to a different tool, and when is, did I just choose information that's more complicated than what I'm familiar with right now? And what I'm capable and, of, yeah. of, of, advance, of advancing yeah. to, yeah. So that's actually personalized learning for self mm -hmm. and getting over that frustration level and doing that social learning to be able to encourage others to go and choose a different material that might work better. Mm -hmm. So it's not just all on the educator. It's kind no. of oh yeah, it's got to be learning on how to learn too. The learner has to know what they want, what they need, what they think, what they know they're capable yeah. of, maybe what they think they're capable of, yeah. and they discover they're not, and that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a process. Yeah. And helping people to break down information into smaller subtopics and just mm, getting people to practice easier. that skill first. Because a lot of this can be very overwhelming, for yeah. sure, when you think yeah. about everything or see everything that's out there to learn on a site or something. Yeah. Like, I can't do all this stuff. Why they have it breaking down? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Just thanks very much. Very educational. <laughs> I try. Yeah. 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 All right. So we are a little after. We started about 5 after 10, I think, about 5 after 11 now almost. Um, so I think it's perfect timing to wrap up. If you do have any desperate questions, urgent questions you want to ask um, Amanda right now, type them in right away. Get them in before yeah. I got a little wrap up thing here to do. Otherwise, there's her email address, amanda.sweet at nebraska.gov. You always reach out to her with any other questions you have about anything in the presentation. Um, and like I said, with the show is being recorded and it will be posted um, onto the Library Commission's YouTube channel. And then the slides will be available as well, so you have a link to those. If everything cooperates with me, YouTube, go to webinar, everything out there. By the end of the day today, the archive should be available. Everyone who attended this morning and registered for today's class will get an email from me letting you know it's available. And then we'll also post it to our various social medias. 
Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's go to any web page here and you type in N Compass Live. Uh, I'm going to show you here on our website where the archive will be. Uh, so far in the world, um, Encompass Live is the only thing called that on the internet. So if you just use your search engine of choice, Google it, you'll come to our page. Um, this is our um, main page and, uh, and nlc.nebraska.gov slash Encompass Live. And we've got our upcoming shows, but right underneath them is a link to our archives. So this is where all our previous shows go. Uh, the most recent ones are at the top of the list and they just go backwards chronologically. So today's show, let's see, last week we had, oh, okay, we had a recording and a presentation. Cool. So we'll have the same setup for this week. So you'll have two links, one that will bump you over to the YouTube recording and one that will link you to the slides. And it'll be at the top of the list here. Um, while I'm here, I'll show you, this is the full archives of Encompass Live. We have a search feature up here where you can search um, the entire archives or just the most recent 12 months. Um, and this is because um, Encompass Live started in January 2009. And we have all of our archives here. If I stood all the way to the bottom, we'd have January, January 7th, 2009 was our very first show. So we did institute a search feature. So you can find links on certain topics. It will search topics, um, the descriptions, names of presenters. Um, or if you want something really recent, just the most recent 12 months worth of um, shows. So do just pay attention. We are going through our archives. Um, everything has a date and lets you know exactly when it was originally broadcast. So um, do pay attention to that. Some of the things here will be old, outdated information, um, broken websites, products or services that don't exist anymore, products and services that have changed significantly since we originally did the show. Um, but we are librarians. We save and archive things. You know, it's one of our archivists that we do and we will always have our entire show archive there um, just for historical purposes. So just pay attention to the dates when you're looking at our archives here. Get back to our main page now. We also do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live where we do post reminders of things when the new show, here's a reminder of login right now for today's show, um, when our recordings are available, no, I don't want to log in for free. Oh, when our recordings are ready, um, when new things have been added to the schedule, that'll be posted on here as well. So if you do like to use Facebook, um, that would be a place to keep up on what we're doing as well. I'll post two or three times a week, not four or five. Um, so it doesn't look like anybody had any desperate, urgent questions right now. That's fine. Um, reach out when you need to. Um, Next week, um, Encompass Live is, as I said, origin in the beginning of the show, broadcast every Wednesday, except next week. <laughs> once a month, once once a year, we do take off a week, and uh, that is during our state library conference, the Nebraska Library Association and School Librarians Association Joint Conference. Um, it's usually sometime in October. It is next week, so we do not have an Encompass Live next week. We're actually doing a joint conference with the Iowa Library Association. Um, uh, in um, Vista, Nebraska. So um, if you are in Nebraska, please uh, enjoy the conference. We do not have a show next week at all. We'll be back on October 9th, which as you can see here is not on the schedule yet. I'm still finalizing what the, the, the session presenter for that. So keep an eye on here and on our website if you wanna get that up there. Um, you can just, so you can register for that and any of our other shows that we have coming up here on the schedule. Um, we've got things booked all the way through the end of the year, ready to go, and we'll get them all uploaded up and posted under there. And as you can see, um, Amanda's pretty sweet text at the end of each month will be on here too. And as she gets her specific topics for each month, uh, nailed down, the description will be expanded to tell you what it's going to be about. Yeah. So that wraps it up for today's show. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for telling, sharing with us today. Um, this is great. I really like the um, the general concepts that you you know talked about ahead yeah. of time before mm -hmm. getting into the nitty-gritty. That is something that a lot of people, I think, don't think about. So I think it was really very, very helpful. This is for everyone. Um, so thank you very much for sharing, talking about robots today. Um, go out and start teaching them. Um, and thank you everyone for attending and hopefully we'll see you um, on a future Encompass Live. Bye-bye.